this, the final and most comprehensive report into the Moorgate tube train disaster is published today. Moorgate, the rush hour crash in which 43 people lost their lives and 74 others were injured, many of them seriously. It was London's worst ever underground crash and one which marred London Transport's proud and still justified reputation as one of the safest public transport systems in the world. Today's report has been compiled by Lieutenant Colonel Ian McNaughton, an ex-Royal Engineer who for the last two years has been the Chief Inspector of Railways. It's a long, complicated and potentially highly controversial report. So tonight we devote the first part of our programme to Moorgate. Not just the official report, but also our own investigation conducted during the last month. Could the crash have been prevented? And what steps have been taken to make sure it doesn't happen again? For obvious reasons, our investigation will cause some people distress. If it does, we apologise in advance, but we feel that the official report, and indeed the results of our own inquiry, are important enough to justify the fullest discussion and publicity. Our report has been compiled by John Stapleton. The date, February the 28th, 1975. The time, 8.47am. The place, an approach tunnel to Moorgate Station. A rush hour train carrying over 300 people is on the last leg of its nine-minute journey from Drayton Park. The train has made the trip four times already that morning, and each time it has done so quite uneventfully. However, this time something goes wrong. Suddenly, and for no apparent reason, it picks up speed. Over points it should cross at 15 miles an hour, it travels at 30. And by the time it enters the station, it's gained even more speed. Seconds later, it's all over. Train 272, travelling at an estimated speed of 36 miles an hour, has careered into a brick tunnel wall. It's a day the relatives of the 43 people killed in the crash can never forget. And for one of them, the wife of driver Les Newson, that crash resulted in a lot more than just the loss of her husband. For as well as a bereavement, Mrs Newson has had to live with allegations that her husband might have been drunk, or that he caused the deaths of all those people by committing suicide. Um, I don't like to think about it too much. Sure. It's too painful. And then when the report came out that he was drunk, that I could never believe. Until the day I died, my husband was not drunk. And not enough to commit suicide. And he had too much to live for. I mean, we just had our first little grandchild, little Robert. And my husband said to my daughter that that was the best present any man could get, especially him, because that's what he wanted. Mrs Newson will draw a little comfort from today's report. Like most other people, she'd hoped that it would clear up once and for all why Moorgate happened. It doesn't. It merely concludes that it was caused by some kind of human failure. In other words, while not saying exactly what went wrong, it still leaves Mr Newson shouldering the blame. It's not necessary for me to say exactly why it happened. If I can establish that it was a lapse, a human failure, and we can produce a system to prevent that human failure having similar results, the report is succeeding in doing its job. In the Colonel's terms, his report has indeed done its job. He's recommended new safety measures, which should ensure that this kind of disaster never happens again. He's also made it quite clear that, although they didn't contribute directly to the crash, a number of routine safety precautions just weren't being observed by staff on this line. Example, before setting out, each train should be thoroughly checked. This one wasn't. Example, each driver should be in possession of a road certificate, a piece of paper verifying that he's familiar with that route. This one wasn't. And furthermore, he'd only had half the training he should have had. Example, each guard is supposed to stay at his controls so that he can reach the emergency brake. This one didn't. He was further along the train, trying to find a paper. Well, whatever the failings of their operating staff, London Transport's engineering department emerged from Moorgate with a great deal of credit. The man in charge was Gordon Hafter, who in recognition of his efforts was awarded the OBE. Train 272 looked like this. It was built in 1938 and had two sets of brakes, designed in such a way that no matter what happened, one set should have gone on. Mr. Hafter just couldn't believe they'd failed. So within an hour of the crash, he was walking through the undamaged parts of the train, examining pressure gauges. 
By this time, most of them read zero. But in one carriage, he found a gauge still registering at pressure. And down here, underneath the train, you can understand what that means. It means that in this auxiliary cylinder here, there was compressed air available, which, had the brakes been applied, would, through these valves here, have slapped the anchors on up there. In other words, the brakes could have been applied, but they weren't. And to find out whether something might have prevented them being applied, they carted every bit of the mechanism back into the workshops. After an enormous amount of work, which included fitting parts of the damaged train onto other trains to see how they responded, they came to the conclusion that there was absolutely nothing to prevent those brakes having been applied. Mind you, there were some red herrings. This is the actual brake lever from train 272. When it was found, it was so bent that it wouldn't actually go on. Could that have been the reason the brakes weren't applied? Well, apparently not. It needed such force to bend it that it must have got like that in the crash. And this, over here, is part of the train's driving equipment. And while looking at this, they reveal something else. Impact with the wall had jammed this camshaft in the intermediate position. Now, what that meant was that at the moment of the impact, the train was under power. It was being literally driven into the wall. Two eyewitnesses, Mr. and Mrs. Board, were standing at the end of the platform, right by the side of the tunnel. They were the last people to see Mr. Newson alive. And they've described to us how they saw him sitting upright with his hands on the controls. Six days later, when rescuers dragged the wreckage from the wall, that's exactly how they found Mr. Newson, still with his hands on the controls. Later, through highlighting the lines of fractures in his arms, X-rays proved beyond all doubt that his hands had been on the controls right up to the moment of impact. What's more, those controls were set like this. The brake handle very slightly on, the master controller, the control that makes the train go, set in a middle position, just as they would be in a train spreading through a tunnel. In other words, Mr. Newson had made no attempt to stop. He'd driven straight into the wall. He hadn't even done what most people would naturally do, that's raise his hands to protect his face. The question is, why? Well, let's take a look at this man. A survivor of Dunkirk, he was known by his colleagues to be extremely meticulous and cautious, all of which makes this crash extremely surprising. With the removal of Mr. Newson's body, the Moorgate disaster took on much more sinister implications. Samples of his body fluids were put into a machine like this, the kind of apparatus they use for analysing blood samples in drink driving cases. The graph that came out of it seemed a damning indictment of driver Newson. This peak told the experts that Mr. Newson had a blood alcohol level of 80 milligrams per 100 millimetres of blood. If he'd been a car driver, enough to convict him. When this was revealed at the inquest, it caused a sensation and resulted in what, for Mrs. Newson at least, were some very distressing headlines. Oh, well, I think that's ridiculous, really, because all he ever drank was tea and maybe a half pint of brown ale, but at that time in the morning going there, he probably had a couple of cups of tea. He was a cup of tea man. However, the fact remains that alcohol was found in Mr. Newson's body. Now, that in itself is not remarkable. Alcohol is frequently produced in dead bodies. The problem here was the difference between the amount of alcohol in Mr. Newson's body, recovered from this, the driver's cab, and the amounts of alcohol discovered in the bodies of the passengers, there in the first carriage. Bodies that had been kept in the same conditions for the same length of time. You see, tests showed that, on average, Mr. Newson's body contained twice as much alcohol as the other bodies in the train. And the toxicologist who carried out the tests, Dr. Anne Robinson, told the inquest that she could only account for this difference by ingestion. In other words, in her opinion, he'd had a drink. A theory that came as a shock to the men who were working with him that morning. Did you at any stage smell alcohol on his breath that morning? No. no. I mean, I stopped and talked to him right as we change ends, and I never noticed anything like that. Did you at any stage smell alcohol on his breath? No. Absolutely not. No. All I gave him was a cup of tea that morning because he said I felt cold and I, I handed him a cup of tea before the fatal trip. It's not just London transport employees who doubt Miss Robinson's conclusions. Several of her scientific contemporaries have also questioned her interpretation of the facts. Among them is Mr. David Nayland. Mr. Nayland, could 
a level of alcohol like this be accounted for by anything other than digestion? Yes, it could indeed. In fact, it could be accounted for um, by, in fact, the same kind of mechanisms that gave rise to the alcohol in the passengers uh, who were also examined, uh, namely uh, uh, the action of certain microorganisms. Even though someone may not have taken any drink of any kind? Oh, yes, indeed. It's totally independent of anything which may or may not have been taken before death. We've had many cases in this laboratory of uh, total teetotalers who have uh, recorded levels uh, as high as this and, in fact, considerably greater than this. So there is then considerable doubt about whether or not Driver Newsom had taken a drink before going to work that day. Nevertheless, this slim possibility gave rise to yet another allegation that was to scar his memory. The allegation that he committed suicide and that the drink, if indeed he took one, was simply Dutch courage. Speculation subscribed to by Dr. Richard Fox, a consultant psychiatrist and advisor on suicide to the Samaritan organization. Uh, I think it's a possibility because to start off with, he was a pretty shy and lo lonely man, and maybe because he was deaf. Because we know that several months before, he went to his family doctor with symptoms of sexual impotence. Now, this can be a presenting symptom for depressive illness, particularly a masked kind of depression, which doesn't present as such. And being the kind of bloke he was, he's not the kind of person, I think, to have wept on people's shoulders and gone out for help. Interesting speculation. But as Dr. Fox admits, that's all it is. Speculation. Against that, one has to weigh a lot of other points. For a start, suicides rarely, if ever, take others with them. What's more, as Mr. Newsom was proud of being a driver, why should he choose to die in such a way that people would think he was a bad driver? That's just a thought. There are also a lot of facts. He had future plans, lots of them. He was looking forward to a holiday in America. He was excited about the prospect of getting a new camera. And at the time of the crash, he had 200 pounds in his pocket, money to buy his daughter a car. Hardly the actions of a man intent on killing himself. However, Perhaps the most damning evidence against this theory comes from his own family. The picture they paint of Mr. Newsom just isn't one of a worried potential suicide. He had too much to live for. I mean, he would never have done a thing like that. Never. He was too happy to do things like that. I mean, I, I couldn't see him doing it anyway. I just couldn't. He couldn't do anything like that. Well... I married him at 18, and I was married to him for 35 and a half years, and the only time we were ever apart was during the war when he was in the army. And we were just in love with each other just as much as we were the day we got married. So, and I think that's good for 35 and a half years. It was just like meeting each other for the first time when we seen each other. Although some people might not believe me, but... It's true, I know how I felt about him and he knew how he felt about me. Incidentally, we also spoke to a lot of Mr. Newsom's workmates, people who'd been with him right up to the start of the last journey. And they didn't think his behaviour was that of a depressed man either. So if it wasn't suicide, if he wasn't driving under the influence of drink, why did Mr. Newsom fail to stop train 272 crashing into that tunnel wall? Could it be that he was a victim of the conditions he worked under? London Transport have an elaborate and impressive system of ensuring that trains don't crash into each other and that they're stopped automatically at signals. But at the end of the line, at stations like Moorgate, they rely entirely on the driver. And there's a huge body of evidence that says that underground drivers just cannot be relied upon to that extent. For example, at Edgware Station in 1945, a driver crashed into the buffers, crushing his cab and slightly injuring some of his passengers. At Tooting Broadway in 1971, a driver died in the wreckage of this train after it had crashed into a blind tunnel. The photographs bear a remarkable resemblance to those of Moorgate. And finally, at Rayner's Lane in 1972, yet another driver was killed. This one after he'd smashed into buffers. Warnings stretching back over 30 years that drivers can and do fail. More recently, there's been this a report commissioned in 1973 by London Transport. The man who wrote it, one of their employees, a Mr. Connock, was asked to look at serious errors on the underground. And one of the first things he found was that drivers made an awful lot of them. 209 in 1972, the year he looked at. And that, he reckons, 
was just the tip of the iceberg. Less than half the real figure. Lots more happened, they just weren't recorded. In his conclusions, Mr. Connock made a chilling comment on the reliability of drivers. He said that he'd found cases where, and we quote, drivers pass right through a station and subsequently are ignorant of their error. He added prophetically, this aspect of occupational errors has frightening implications. Elsewhere in his report, Mr. Connock says that drivers get into rather mechanical ways of thinking and mechanical ways of seeing things. They don't expect the unexpected. And when you actually look at the job, you can understand why he says that. It's a rather monotonous job, and potentially a very tiring one. A notion which John Moss, for 35 years a tube driver, wholeheartedly supports. Very often you, you, you think to yourself as you're going along, especially if there's a bit uh, a tardy stretch from one station to the other, mm -hmm. you think, am I going north or south? And it's not until you come to the next station that, you know. When I was on late turns, say around about nine, between nine and twelve sometimes, you'd tend to doze off a bit. Well, then I used to stand up, push my seat back and stand up, see, to get up. And it's, it is surprising how tired, and you can easily drop off to sleep. So could it be that driver Newson was just plain tired? He'd only had six hours sleep that night, and he'd gone to work without having any breakfast. And there's another thing. This line is generally regarded by tube train drivers as being a pretty boring one. It's short, there aren't many stops, there's not much for them to do. What's more, when he entered Moorgate Station, the lights in the tunnel behind him were on. Now, lights on in a tunnel generally indicate that the station is closed. So, could it be that, because he was tired, because this is a rather monotonous line, Mr. Newson had a temporary lapse. He thought that Moorgate Station was closed and that the tunnel ahead of him actually went somewhere. It's not a totally ridiculous suggestion. One station on this line is frequently closed, and at least it would explain why, shortly before the crash, Mr. Newson didn't even put up his arms in self-defense. He just crashed into that wall as though it wasn't there. Further support for this theory comes from that report by Mr. Connock. He found that, on a daily basis, drivers were most likely to make a serious error after having worked for two hours. When this crash happened, Mr. Newson had been working for just two hours, 14 minutes. Mr. Connock also made the point that, generally speaking, drivers made most of their mistakes within the first two years of their working lives. Mr. Newson had been a tube train driver for just over a year. Mr. Connock decided that London Transport's training system wasn't all it might be, that drivers were leaving the training department in many ways ill-equipped to do their job, lacking some essential skills which they only acquired in later years. He recommended that the training system, which hadn't changed in 20 years, be reviewed. It wasn't. No changes have been made. And until we showed it to him, the man in charge of training drivers hadn't even seen Mr. Connock's report. So, no action there. But a lot of activity down in the tunnel where 43 people died. For a start, the station has been taken over by British Rail. The black wall the train crashed into has been painted white and every grim reminder of that horrific day has been carefully removed. There have also been some other changes. British Rail have already installed the sort of equipment that should make sure the same thing never happens again. The most obvious part of it is this sophisticated and new buffer. One apparently quite capable of stopping trains travelling as fast as 10 miles an hour. And to make sure that trains don't travel at more than 10 miles an hour when they arrive there, there's more technology at the line. A series of what they call speed trips. Little devices which ensure that if a driver is travelling at more than a safe speed, his brakes will be automatically applied. That kind of equipment isn't new. The same sort of thing has been around for more than 20 years. Lieutenant Colonel McNaughton knows that. London Transport know that. And Lieutenant Colonel McNaughton knows that London Transport know that. Yet in his report, published today, Lieutenant Colonel McNaughton says that no blame can be attached to London Transport for not installing these devices at Moorgate. Yeah, as I explained in my report, there's never been an accident like Moorgate before. It can't be classed with the ordinary buffer stop collision, of which there have been some in the past. And I can see no reason why London Transport should be anticipated an accident of this type to occur. 
And certainly, there are no justifications for spending money to prevent accidents that haven't happened. But, in fact, Mr Bruce, it did happen, and despite what the Colonel says, I think a lot of people will be wondering why London Transport didn't install the equipment that might have prevented Moorgate. So, why didn't they? Well, uh, you had what uh, um, Colonel McNaughton said. It's one of those things that, with hindsight, most serious accident we've ever had, with hindsight, one can say, well, if you had done this or you'd done that, you could have prevented the accident. As it, as it uh, happens, we have taken uh, the, the advice of, of Colonel McNaughton. We are now installing uh, certain devices which will, in the end, prevent such an accident ever happening again. But all this is after the event. And most uh, uh, safety devices which have been applied on railways throughout the world have always taken place after an accident. Well, that's in, in itself a very sad commentary on... on, on <laughs> on safety factors on, on railways, but can I put it to you that the writing was on the wall for this? You'd had three accidents which proved that drivers just cannot be relied upon at the end of a line. You'd had the report of Mr. Connock that said drivers cannot be re relied upon at the end of the line. Well, let, let us uh, deal with uh, Mr. Connock's report because you've made quite a, a thing of that. Uh, Mr. Connock was an administrative trainee. He was given an assignment in the department to look at the question of errors uh, trainman's errors which we considered to be serious. Now none of the errors, the 209 which you quote, were in fact errors against safety. They were, they errors. were ne nevertheless serious errors. There we were serious errors in men our... going through stations and there not many gone through them. There were serious errors in our book but they were not against the safety, a train safety. Well, None even, of them. even so. I mean, not actually talking now, about his conclusions. Take, well, if you take, you take the point that you made about going through stations. In his report, I think he says there were 32 overruns at stations. Instances where trains it's had overshot, over like the one Do you, Have the you any idea how many times uh, the, the trains stop at stations? There's 90 million stops a year in a station, and what we're talking about is 30 overruns, misjudgments. No. Not, not deliberate overruns, but misjudgments of a stopping mark. Now, that's what we're talking about. I accept that entirely, Mr. Bruce, but nevertheless, I, I must put it to you again that given this report, given the past accidents that there have been, surely you should have said to yourselves, we must try and do something about this. The technology we're, was there, you could have put it in. We're never satisfied <coughs> that we have done enough, but this uh, technology, this uh, uh, business, we've never ever before had a, a, a driver in a hundred years of operation had a driver drive a driver train into a terminal end. It's made a misjudgment, but, but, the, but the, uh, the overrun and the buffer stop collision, as Colonel McNaughton pointed out, it, it was quite different. Well, Look, it was quite unprecedented. But given all this evidence, given the Connacht report, why did you ignore it? What's the point of we employing the ignore, money to We it? didn't ignore the Connacht report. We looked at it, and it didn't tell us anything we, we didn't know already. But he did recommend that you make some changes in your training system. He said that drivers were coming out ill-equipped, and that they only picked up these well, things. Well, he, he was administrative trainee. He hadn't been in the operating department more than about five minutes. But he's the man you employed to do the survey. He, wa he, he was an administrative trainee. He was given an assignment to look at it from our point of view. We looked at his report and we we knew that uh, a lot of the things which he said we already knew all about. Are you, have you in, are you in fact now considering uh, making any changes in the training system? No, the, the training system is always under constant review. We never, we're never satisfied with our training methods and the training system is under constant review all the time. But we cannot make changes just because somebody says something about it. These have been these uh, devices and uh, systems that we've adopted in the training school have been there for a long time and have been have, uh, many many people have passed through the training school. Could I just put a final point to you sir and that's the point about safety on this particular line. Although we said it didn't contribute directly to the crash and one accepts that. Isn't it something that could give commuters considerable cause for alarm? I'm not quite sure... Uh, the well, the safety act aspects which Mr. McNaught, Lieutenant Colonel McNaughton referred to as being flagrantly abused by staff on this particular line. Well, we, we, we are concerned about staff not uh, obeying their uh, instructions and taking their uh, uh, precautions, their proper precautions, because they're in their interest as well as the passengers to ensure that they have a train in perfect condition. Very briefly, have you done anything about it? We have, in fact, uh, made sure that this uh, sort of thing is, is properly followed up and, uh, and doesn't happen. Well, that at least ends on a very reassuring note. Mr. Bruce, thank you very much indeed.
tragic event changed the life of one Lawrence Marx, me, my dad and Moorgate. On the 28th of February 1975, a London underground train overran its platform and crashed headlong into a solid concrete wall. 43 people were killed. Moorgate is the worst underground crash in British history. It still lives on for many of those involved. Lawrence Marks lost his father in the crash. But for him, the tragedy was the start of his journey to becoming one of Britain's most successful comedy writers. Lawrence is the man behind sitcoms such as Goodnight Sweetheart, what are you doing? Birds of a Feather, Do you mind? I am not working class. I'm Jewish. And The New Statesman. None of those would have ever been written had the Moorgate train crash not happened. Lawrence believes the crash changed his life. More than 30 years on, he's going to try and discover the true impact of his father's sudden death on his life and work. It's a journey, and as with any journey, you don't quite know where you're going to finish up, and you don't know how you're going to feel when you get there. was 21 when his mother died and 26 when his father was killed in the Moorgate train crash. I'm trying to think if there's a picture of him and myself together. There isn't a photograph of my dad and myself together. At least if there is, I haven't got it. I'm finding this very disturbing because it's, it's throwing open questions that I didn't want to have to answer, neither did I think I would ever ask. To try to resolve his relationship with his dad, Lawrence has decided to revisit his past. He's going back to North London, where his father's journey ended and his life began. Just over 30 years ago, Bernie Marks began his last ever journey here at Drayton Park Station. He boarded the 838 train to Moorgate. When he got on that train, that was the last time he was ever going to set foot on the soil again. Ten minutes later, he was dead. Lawrence's memories of his father, Bernie, date from the post-war years of the 1950s. It was 1975. Lawrence had a job as a journalist on the Sunday Times. The last Friday in February, just a week after his row with his father, he received a phone call. I was finishing a story that had to be filed that afternoon when the telephone rang. And it was my stepmother, Eve, who had said to me, um, I, have you heard the news? Which is an odd thing to say to a news reporter. And I said no, and she said, well, a train has crashed in London and they think there's a lot of people dead. And I said, well, why are you telling me this? And she said, because I think your father might be on the train. The first message that went back from the officer in charge was that he wanted six pumps and six ambulances and that this was a major accident. Moorgate Station was the last stop of the Highbury branch of the Northern Line, which ran from Drayton Park in North London. Unusually, the station was a dead end. At the end of the platform, a short overrun tunnel led into a solid concrete wall. The driver has unfortunately gone through the station and there's a back wall. and He's um, gone through the buffers and hit the back wall. Brian Goodfellow was among the first firefighters on the scene. We had streams of passengers getting off from the carriages that had only been shunted. So when we got into the, into the first carriage, we was helping people out that were sprained ankles and, you know, rick necks and arms and moaning and groaning. The emergency services had no idea of the true scale of the disaster hidden in the tunnel. London transport engineers knew that this was a six-car train, but only three and a half cars were on the platform. 
I knew that the third vehicle was partly in the tunnel, therefore there must have been the rest of that vehicle, a trailer vehicle in front of it, and the final driving motor car in front of that, all within that short tunnel, squashed together. The first and second carriages had been bent and crushed into V-shapes inside the tunnel. Among those trapped in the wrecked second carriage was Peter Patterson. I must have been knocked out for about 20 minutes, I should think. When I woke up, it was absolute pitch darkness. And there was somebody lying across my feet. Um, and uh, I realized that that was a dead person. And then a man on my right who was uh, groaning and um, saying that he was dying. And um, so I grabbed his hand and said, no, you, you're going to be OK. Um, I think he wasn't, in fact. What can relatives do at this stage who may be worried Relatives about who may be worried should telephone 623 4421. Casualty Clary, can I help you? With scores of passengers trapped underground, the police set up an emergency number for anxious relatives. Do you think he was on that train? He said, could you give us some details about your father? Does he have any recognisable marks on his face or body that we could identify him by? Should he be down there? What time did he go? I left this information and I then phoned my brother and sister. And I said, look, I think you should come over because it is possible, and no more than possible, that our dad is in the train that crashed this morning at Moorgate Station. Deep inside the tunnel, a fire crew had found a way into the second carriage, which had smashed into the roof. When we looked down, you had a whole carriage load of people in a third of the carriage, all on top of one another. And it was just a melting pot of, of human suffering, uh, you know, complete entanglement of people arms sticking from one person and an arm from another person but you couldn't see the head or shoulders of another person. Or you could see these, this, these people start, and it started to wriggle and move as some of them wanted to get out and, and the noise and the shouting. You felt so helpless really because you couldn't just say, OK, well, let's get them out, let's move that and we'll get them out. It wasn't like that. It was like those, uh, that game, you know, you get the game with sticks where they all fall down and you have to take them off one at a time. That was the situation. It's now 1.30, nearly six hours after the crash, and they're still bringing injured passengers up the escalator behind me from platform nine. And there we sat and watched the news and kept ringing this emergency nut number to see if any information had come in, and it hadn't. Your imagination starts playing games with you. And I remember one of the games it was playing with me was that he had been concussed, somehow had got out of the train, and was now wandering around London not knowing where he was. There had never been a major emergency like Moorgate. Managing the situation was left to ambulance man Ron Perkins. It was not like a, a plane crash or road accident or something like that, where you could look and assess and know exactly what you had to deal with. At Moorgate, we didn't have a clue just how many people were involved. We'd no special way of dealing with it. I had some memo pads and I was writing on that, where the casualties were going. And that's how it was dealt with. It was done by the seat of our pens, I suppose. After a few hours, the rescuers reached Peter Patterson. I didn't actually remember being pulled out. My mind was elsewhere at that moment. And um, I, I got out onto the platform, and then I was uh, led out of the station by a couple of ambulance men. And it was a great relief to get out. I'd heard of this thing called Survivor Guild. And, and I must say, I, I, I did feel that. You ask the question of yourself, well, why me? Why did I get out? And all those other poor people didn't. For many of those trapped, help arrived too late. 
When we got through to the very last carriage, a crew had gone along and cut a square hole in the roof. And whoever cut that hole and peeled the roof back and shone their torch down must have got a shock and a horror because they were all looking up. They must have been alive when that hole was cut. And I can remember going along and they were still looking up for where the light had come. But because of the protraction of how long it took us to get to them, they must have suffocated. We just couldn't get to them. We just couldn't get to them in time. Inspector, you've been down a few minutes ago. How far have rescuers managed to get into the tunnel now? They have now got all the way through to the front of the front coach, which is at the end of that tunnel. I don't recall whether I truly believed at this point he was dead. He seemed to me to be immortal. He was a 68-year-old man that looked 52 at most, very fit, very energetic, and nothing would ever kill him. By this time, there were no more survivors. Rescuers were only releasing fatalities. It was, um, it was something else down there. We were just there basically to, to, to carry people upstairs to get them, to take them out. And uh, everyone we took out was on a stretcher covered up. So we just really stretcher bearers. Nothing at all that we could do for anybody. I've never liked dealing with dead people at all, like, you know? Um, I always feel for people. And it wasn't very nice because you knew somewhere, somewhere, someone weren't going home. They weren't, their loved ones were waiting for them. It's horrible. Lawrence has lived with the memory of his father's death for over 30 years, but he's never discovered exactly how he died. Firefighter Brian Goodfellow removed many bodies at Moorgate and vividly remembers one victim whose description matches Lawrence's father. There was a gentleman sitting in his seat still and he had people up to his waist. He looked distinguished, he was silvered haired and someone said, well, he looks military, he looks like ex-military. And we called him the city gent from then on. He was one of the first people that we got out. As far as I know, my father was in the second carriage. Um, I don't quite know where in the second carriage he was. The only way I could t tell you if it was is if you've got some photograph or, or, or a press cutting, yeah. because I, I can go into detail if you want me to. Well, um, it's 30 years. I do have a photograph because I do. Happens. Well, I, I tell you exactly I'm how wondering I'm, whether he's your man. Well, I will try to help. Um, well, this was he. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah it, that's our city gen. That's my, that's my, that, that is my, my city gen. Um, I don't know, you said it's 30 years ago, it feels like yesterday to me now. Well, it's astonishing that he should have been carved in your memory, um, and it should have been him. I just find that quite astonishing. Unfortunately, where he was sitting, the people had been on top of him, um, and with the force of the people pushing him back, his head had gone through the windows at the rear. Oh, I see. I can see him now, unfortunately. And he's sitting there, but he still had that air of dignity, if you, you know, and a, a military, it was, I don't know if he was no, a military he man, did, he did have, but he, he had a, a military bearing about he him. He was a policeman. He was a policeman. I didn't know when I came here today that I'd be meeting the man that rescued my father. The very fact that I'm able to sit here with you this afternoon has really just eased 30 years of wondering, um, and it wasn't something when I got up this morning that I thought I would set out to do. So it's quite astonishing, and I thank you. Well, I... Lawrence finally knows how his dad died. 31 years ago, as London buried its dead, the burning question was, why? In a bizarre twist of fate, the job of investigating the tragedy would fall to Lawrence. Lawrence Marks had lost his father to the horrific tube crash at Moorgate. It took five days to retrieve all the victims, including the driver, 
The final death toll was 43. 82 people were injured. Lawrence returned to work at the Sunday Times. The editor told him they wanted a major investigation of the crash and put him in charge. His father's death had delivered him one of the most prestigious jobs in Fleet Street. My motivation was to find out what happened and what killed my dad. And I was here given a God-given opportunity to make a mark in my chosen profession. And I saw it as too good an opportunity to waste. Lawrence began his year-long investigation by pulling together the facts of the case. He needed to find out why the driver of train 272, Leslie Newson, had overshot the platform and crashed into a dead-end tunnel. Immediately after the crash, the brakes were inspected by senior engineer Gordon Hafter. There was still air in the brake cylinders of the vehicles which were relatively undamaged. That meant to say that there had not been a brake failure. At what point that the brakes had been applied is another matter, of course. Drivers were expected to slow down on approach to Moorgate Station before switching off the motors, coasting into the platform and braking to a halt. Leslie Newson failed to do this. Well, as we approached Moorgate Station, at the time when the train usually begins to slow up, it began, in my opinion, to accelerate quite fast. When we left Old Street, I had the distinct feeling that the train was travelling faster than it should have been travelling. There was a at least one bend when I thought that there was a, a kind of a ping as if the train had rocked too far one way because of its speed. The train came in but didn't slow down and it wasn't until it was really basically halfway down the platform and then it keeps coming and you think oh my god this is not quite right. To enter the station Newson had to pass a crossover point which directed trains into one of two platforms the speed limit at the crossover was 15 miles per hour. From all the evidence we have, the train was travelling just over 35 miles an hour as it approached the station. At this speed, the crossover should have jolted Newson from his seat. People on the train that I spoke to all told me they were thrown from their seats or if they were strap hanging, were certainly thrown down the carriage. It was a major jolt. I found it interesting that everybody else in the carriages were thrown from their seat, but not Leslie Noose. He was looking straight ahead. His pose was of somebody in quite a determined frame of mind. At this point, the disaster could still have been averted. Newson controlled his speed by pushing down and turning his master controller. The controller had an emergency feature. This lever is called the dead man's handle, so that if the handle is let go for any particular reason, such as a medical reason, you will get an emergency brake application whether the train is moving, stationary or whatever. Newson did not let go of the handle. The position in which his controls were found confirmed what witnesses had seen. That is exactly how it was found. I don't think the driver ever took his hand off the dead man's handle. The crash itself so distorted the equipment underneath that it was jammed in that position, which was in a way a very fortunate piece of evidence it showed us that the train had been motoring right up to the moment of impact. For Lawrence, the evidence was mounting up. I was at this time coming to a conclusion that I was looking at a case of the driver not wanting to stop the train. But there was no suicide note and therefore no proof. A government inquiry would later blame the crash on the driver's behaviour, but it could not conclude suicide. Nor could an inquest held by the City of London coroner, which recorded a verdict of accidental death. Unsatisfied with the verdict, Lawrence went to see the coroner, Dr David Paul. 
he was astonished by what he was told. He said, between you and me, I don't think it was accidental death. And he said, it is my belief, Lawrence, that it was suicide. But I can't direct a jury towards suicide unless there is a note. And there wasn't. And he put down his cup of tea, and I recall this as if it were yesterday, and he looked me in the eye and he said, but I would move along those lines in your investigation if I were you. So I said to Dr Paul, is there any document that I could possibly have that would help me in my investigation over the next 48 weeks? And he said, he laughed. And I said, why do you laugh? He said, well, of course, there is a document. It's a document of the complete transcript of the inquest. There isn't another one. I have it. It's in my safe. It's over there. And, um, and of course, I can't let you see it. And then he looked at his watch and he said, so it was very nice meeting you. And he stood up and I stood up and we shook hands. And then he looked back at me and said, the document you want is in a safe over there. The door is open and I'm back from lunch about quarter to three. And he left. And he left me in the room. And to cut a very long story short, I stole the document. Lawrence now had the evidence seen by the official inquiries. Although the post-mortem found Driver Newson to be in perfect health, experts told the coroner he could have become suddenly ill. However, very few illnesses would have allowed him to keep holding down the dead man's handle, and as he had stopped normally at the preceding station, he would have had to become ill in the 60 seconds it took to travel on to Moorgate. Unconvinced, Lawrence spent months seeking plausible explanations for the driver's behaviour. He was drawn to the testimony of the guard on the train, Robert Harris. The cross-examination with Bob Harris intrigued me perhaps more than any other of the cross-examinations in the entire 900 pages. Do you remember, said Dr. Paul, any other occasion when a train driven by a Mr. Newson overshot? I believe yes. It was either Monday or Tuesday before the crash. Did you speak to Mr. Newson about the overshoot? Yeah, when we got to Moorgate, I said, what happened there then? And Leslie said, well, he said, just misjudged it, I suppose. Well, this was interesting to me. What did the overshoot mean? A passenger had reported a second overshoot by Newson that week. Lawrence discussed the overshoots with American suicide expert, Dr. Bruce Danto. He said, that doesn't sound like misjudgment to me. That sounds like a man who's getting the feeling of how to run a train into a wall. Lawrence discovered one more crucial piece of evidence. Toxicologists had found alcohol present in driver Newson's body. There were two theories on why the alcohol was there. One was fermentation had occurred in his body due to the heat of the tunnel. The other was he'd had a drink that morning. The press wrongly seized on this theory, much to the distress of Newson's wife. When the report came out that he was drunk. That I could never believe. Until the day I died, my husband was not drunk. Toxicologist Dr Anne Robinson told Lawrence that Newson was not drunk, but he had had a large drink. The man had had a drink. Why had he had a drink? Of course it could have been a Dutch courage drink, that he knew what he was going to do and wanted to stiffen his resolve to do it. Lawrence began writing up his findings. His interpretation of the evidence went further than the coroner's inquest and the government's report. My final conclusion was that the driver took his life and the life of 42 other people. Leslie Newson's family have never accepted Lawrence's interpretation of the evidence. They say nothing in Newson's behaviour gave any indication of suicide and blame the accident on a sudden medical condition of the brain that prevented him from stopping the train. They point out that neither the government inquiry nor the coroner's inquest concluded suicide. <laughs>
A year after the crash, the Sunday Times went to press with Lawrence's feature. His life had been dominated for years by his father and for months by his father's death. Now, for the first time, he was free to move on. Whilst it's a terrible, sinking feeling to have to confront, there was something going on somewhere inside me that said, yes, I'm free. The prison doors have opened, I can go out, and now I can be what I want to be. Slowly, I felt able to become a different person. I felt able to express myself, and I felt liberated. As a child, making his father laugh had won Lawrence approval. Now, after his father's death, he began to express himself through comedy. After his father's tragic death, Lawrence's career as a comedy writer took off. Following their triumph with Frankie Howard, he and Morris wrote a string of successful television sitcoms, including Shine on Harvey Moon, Birds of a Feather, and The New Statesman. We move on two levels. We move on a conscious level, what we know we've done, and we know why we've done it. And then there's this unconscious level where you dream, where you imagine and if you're working in fiction where you're drawing upon your past and what was still within there although i didn't know it was my dad so did his father's death really liberate lawrence as he's always claimed his elder sister shirley is one of many who have never accepted his attitude i can't understand why his death would have liberated you why couldn't you do it in his lifetime and show him that you were something, you had substance, yeah. that you were okay, you were talented. Yeah. Why not tell him that? Are you disappointed that his life was cut short and you weren't able to show him and tell him and therefore you built up this thing about liberation after his death? I, I don't understand this. When I embarked upon this journey, I felt I knew him well and didn't like what I knew. That's not to say I didn't like him, but I didn't like certain aspects of what he did to me. Having come through the other side of it, I'm now beginning to realise I know him better in death than I ever knew him in life. And consequently, I can draw upon him as if he were still here by being able to place him within the fictional characters I create. He is my dramatic muse. Isn't that a strange thing to say? You would have never, never ever have thought it. Um, when I embarked upon this journey that I would sit here in Finsbury Park and call my father my dramatic muse because it, it, it would have been unthinkable. So you have incorporated him into your life, he's, into your being? He's every bit of my being and he's at the top of that well from which I draw my ideas. I think what it all really goes to show is that someone can die and not be dead, that your soul lives on, and what we talk about is physical death. I will not see him anymore. But of course, I've seen him so many times. He's come in different guises. He's come as Harvey Moon. He's come as Bernie in Get Back. He might have even come as Reg Deadman in Goodnight Sweetheart. But he's, he's there. And whilst people say, well, of course, he doesn't look anything like your dad, that doesn't matter. The soul and the memory exist. In a way, he never died. 